But as far as our speakers today, I'll introduce David last um, because he's our first speaker and it saves a bit of repetition. So our second speaker will be Phil Mansell. Phil is joining us from Plymouth Marjong University and Phil is going to do a session on student life um, and what to expect at university as a student. And then last but certainly no means least, Matt Ball is joining us from Keel University and Matt's going to talk about the transition to university and what to expect there from you know, perhaps going from school, which is school or college, which is probably where most people watching this are now, and what to expect when you get to university and then the transition that's involved. But if I can now introduce our first speaker and David, do feel free to uh, get your presentation ready while I'm doing so. David Handy is joining us from Newman University and David is a senior student, student recruitment manager um, over there and David is going to do a session on online university events and online university events you'll notice um, are everywhere at the moment um, but 12-13 weeks ago um, they were few and far between and, and David's institution Newman University is, is doing loads you know, as far as institutions really really setting the path and, and have, announcing loads of brilliant events so I couldn't think of anyone better to do an introduction to online university events then David so David the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, John. Um, thank you so much for, for inviting us to come and speak to you this afternoon. It's a great pleasure to get to speak to so many people uh, about online university events. Um, so a little bit about me to start with. Uh, that, that's my really cheesy photo there on the right hand side. Uh, in the days when we were allowed on university campus. Um, I've been at Newman now for about two years, but before that I used to be head of sixth form and head of careers. I spent about 15 years in secondary school, so I've got a lot of experience of supporting young people and their families as they move through the world of university. Um, you know, I'll share some details later on about some sessions we're running, but you know, if anyone's got any questions after the event, do feel free to drop me an email or contact me through, through our university website. So today we're going to cover virtual exhibitions, we're going to look at virtual open days, and we're going to look at webinars and the other slightly weird and wonderful things that may well be out there at the moment. Um, you know, I've had a look at what, what's out there in the sector, um, been in another meeting actually this morning, having a look at uh, virtual opportunities across universities. So hopefully I'll be able to identify some things you might want to be looking out for and UniTaste today is a great website and as John mentioned there there's that link where you can find um, the online events that are coming up you know over the next period of time and I would encourage you to really be engaging with those. So let's break it down, let's start with virtual exhibitions. So traditionally this time of year I'd be saying to you you know go to a UCAS exhibition, go to a university, UK university search fair well, this year, things are a bit different, aren't they? You know, we've all been sort of living and working from the same place for the last three and a half months. Um, frustratingly, the weather was very nice, wasn't it, <laughs> during lockdown? And now lockdown's sort of easing slightly. Look out my window here. It's throwing yet down with rain here in the Midlands. But uh, yeah, we would have been at see, meeting you at real face-to-face -face exhibitions. Well, that isn't, doesn't mean to say there's been nothing running. UK University Search actually ran quite a big online fair a few weeks ago. Um, and I believe that's still online for you to access now. The only thing that's not there is the uh, the live chat function. But these virtual exhibitions, yeah, they're, they're ran by different providers. So UK University Search, the one that ran fairly recently. I know UCAS are looking at them, um, but more on a subject level. So if you're interested in either medicine, they will have a, a virtual exhibition just for you. But typically, virtual exhibitions, they're porting what we would do in the real world. I'm sure you've all been to careers fairs. You know, where all the universities, apprenticeship providers are in a, a large exhibition space um, and you come and ask questions about the universities, you may ask questions about the courses. But one thing I think is really powerful about an exhibition more generally would be that you walk around and you'll see universities that you didn't know existed. Um, and you can do, and cook, they offer your course, which is even better. But when you're at a virtual event, you can do exactly the same thing. Um, you know, I've been to a couple of these now and you can walk around, you know, walk virtually around the event. You can have a look at the university's backdrops. You'll say, oh, they offer sport. I want to have a chat with them. And what you'll find on a virtual event is there might be links where you can sign up to get a prospectus to information about courses, to chat with current students on a platform like Unibuddy. And there'll normally be a live chat um, when these events are actually running live for you to chat with representatives in the same way that you would do in a face-to-face -face exhibition. And I think that's really powerful. Now, my experience of, of events recently is that students have gone around, they've sort of done their research, 
they've started some universities they really want to speak to and they know that but i'm not so sure that people have been going to sort of the, the general walk around and one thing i would really ask you to do is when you, you you're at these virtual exhibitions do engage with the chat you know we're, we're all here on the university stand and we want to help you um and i think that's really important um so be on the lookout for virtual exhibitions as we move through into the autumn at the moment i know ucas and uk university such a booking um for face-to-face -face events in the autumn um, if they're possible to run safely if not they're going to take a decision and move those to sort of to, to online so do keep your eyes open i'm sure schools and colleges will be very much guiding you on with regard to that um i want to look as well at virtual open days again we're very much in open day season at the moment you know where you're probably planning which university open days that you want to go to you know perhaps traveling perhaps working at which hotels you want to stay in well I don't know of a university that's got a face-to-face -face open day um, over the next you know, month or so. I think everyone has, has had to move online. We, we've actually run two at Newman. Uh, we had one in June and we ran one just this weekend, just gone. So when you go to an open day, typically you'd expect to go and you'd register, you'd be shown to where there may be presentations happening, there might be an introductory talk, there might be subject presentations, there might be campus tours, opportunities to speak with student ambassadors, all that kind of thing. Well, you can do pretty much all of that at a virtual open day. Um, the only thing that you actually physically can't do at the moment would be to go and visit that university campus. Um, so a virtual open day, generally you'll get the, uh, the information sent out in advance. Um, you'll be able to engage with activities. Some of them may be pre-recorded, some of them might be live, and that's really important to, to have a look at that. I'm gonna talk about that more in a moment. But it's a really good opportunity for you to engage in it the same way that you would if you'd been to, to go and visit and to ask those really important questions. I've mentioned here virtual tours. Um, whilst you can't actually go and visit the campus at the moment, you know, it could well be that you go on a, uh, a virtual tour. You know, at Newman, certainly, we've got one running on our website and you can visit all of our facilities virtually. I know other universities have got similar. Um, but other things that I wanted to talk about really were sort of the other opportunities that are out there, you know, webinars, you know, John mentioned, you know, we, we were fairly early into the webinar program and I know I've spoken to thousands of people over the course of the last three months and we will continue to run webinars. We've got them booking at the moment to the end of August, but we're going to run them through to the end of the year at the very least. And I'm looking at the moment and I know many universities will be just to see when you guys are back in, in colleges and schools later in the year. You know, are you going to be back in full time? How are we going to run those? And I think what I'm going to do is like, we'll probably run some lunchtime sessions on things like the university admissions process. And, but we also run some maybe at tea time um, or in an evening. So there's opportunities for you to access those around your studies. And you'll find webinars on all manner of things out there. You know, I think the more popular ones are probably the, the university admissions, so writing personal statements, how to complete a UCAS, student finance, how to pick a university course, all those different things that are out there. But you will also find some, some subject specific ones I know that are running perhaps in a live format. And I think the power of live, it's fantastic because you can ask questions as, as you go along. Um, you know, in fact, I would say I think students find it easier to ask questions in virtual sessions um, based upon my experience. You also find to engage with universities virtually, there'd be other things where it could be live chats running on university websites. There might be Twitter takeovers, Facebook takeovers where you know, there are things happening, you can ask questions. Um, and Unibuddy, I know for many universities, they're using Unibuddy as a platform where you can ask current students um, questions about their experiences of study you know we've certainly got that running and i know a lot of other universities have as well um, so you know do be looking at the opportunities that are out there now i want to give you some some guidance really about virtual open days um, you could use this guidance about um you know face-to-face -face events when they eventually get up and running and also when you're preparing to go to a virtual careers fair as well i really think a successful event for, for you guys as students is all about the prep so plan ahead by having a read about the courses you're interested in you know if you've, there's questions you're going to want to ask write them down um, the advantage with a virtual open day is you know you're probably going to, be going to quite a few stick them in a word document and you can copy and paste them when you're speaking to uh the academics and the representatives so you haven't got to sit and type those questions out every time you can have a bank of them you know in in a word document perhaps to be able to do that 
if you think about accommodation, you know, perhaps explore the accommodation options that are available on university websites first. So that way, if you've got questions, you know, you've got those on hand ready to ask during the, the live um, virtual open day event and really have a plan together for your day. You know, I mentioned there might be live sessions or there might be pre-records or a mix of the two. So kind of work out a plan, you know, what, you know, if there are particular times you need to be attending to see a live session or if it's a case of everything's pre-recorded and you can drop in and ask questions as and when, but work out what your priority is. So whether that's to, to see the information about your courses first, perhaps presentations on those, um, perhaps to drop into accommodation, ask questions of the finance team, the admissions team. You know, there might be particular things you want to do. So kind of work out a plan. And one of the things I would say is with the virtual events, you can go to multiple on day if they're running. So, you know, if the traditional face-to-face -face exhibitions, you, know, you might have been you know, struggling to get from one place to another. Whereas with virtual open days, actually, you've just got to whiz across to another website effectively. So you could do multiple events in one day and you're going to save money on your hotels and on your travel as well. So important things to think about. So during virtual open days themselves, you know, there may well be virtual tours running during an event, you know, if you explore that campus. And I'd encourage you to do those. I think that's really important. The presentations that the universities have created for you, again, you know, there's a lot of information in those. I've seen them at our events, but I've seen them, you know, at some other universities as well. You know, there's a lot of information there. You know, hopefully they will answer a lot of your questions. Um, but not only will you find presentations on you know, subject areas, but you'll perhaps find a welcome presentation from a vice chancellor or you know, things on um, the university application process, on accommodation, on admissions, student support, the student union. There might be lots of different presentations that you wish to attend. And really, for me, crucially, ask questions, ask lots of questions during these events. Um, you know, there's always lots of opportunities to do so. And I think in some ways it is easier in a virtual event. You haven't got a queue to speak to someone. And like I say, you can perhaps copy and paste your questions in, you know, so and the answers that you get, I would sort of keep them elsewhere. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So after a virtual event, you know, things don't end at that point. Um, it could well be that there's videos and materials that you can view back after that exhibition. But this is my top tip to you. I know you're going to be going to a lot of virtual open days, virtual events over the course of the next few months. Get yourself a PowerPoint document and create a slide or two for each event that you go to. You might want to take screenshots because you know, they will blur one into another, I'm sure, after you've been to a few. Um, you know, put notes in there about things you really liked about that university and that course, things maybe you didn't like so much, things you need to find out more. If there are questions you asked, you could record the answers in there. Um, you know, if there are people that you met and you've got their contact details, scribble those in, because you might want to follow up with any conversations um, that you may have. You know, I think it's important to we do that. And that way you can start to whittle down your choices, you know, to the five that hopefully you put onto your UCAS form. Um, normally, I would say for students, for every um, option they put onto that form, you need to have visited that university. Well, I think this year, my, my advice to you is going to be slightly different. I want you to have engaged virtually with that university. So whether that is through virtual open days, you know, live chats, webinars, however if you're going to do that, I think you need to extensively engage with them um, to ask those questions. Now, it might well be you want to consider making another visit. Um, in the autumn, it may well be that you're able to go around and have a look. Um, you know, uh, Certainly, the, the plan that we've got will be that uh, individual family groups will be able to book a, a tour to go around our campus. I know other universities will be looking to do similar. Um, like I say, perhaps you might want to attend other webinars. Lots to do to follow up there. Um, so I've given you lots of really useful pointers, I think. Um, so where to find virtual events? Unitaste today is a great resource for finding. And I'm not just saying that because John's invited us on today. Um, you know, it is a really good place where you can find those things that are happening. University websites are a wealth of, it, or a wealth of information. I know UCAS have got uh, virtual events recorded on their site. And other providers such as UK University Search have got virtual events running. You might want to have a look there. Um, so your next steps, as I bring my section of this, uh, this presentation to a close, you know, attend virtual open days and virtual events, you know, get on to making your UCAS application. And it's important that you're using your time now, perhaps to be working on personal statements and perhaps beginning that application. Get that sent, meet all your deadlines, then reply to your offers, apply to student finance at the right time. You know, typically that'll be next February for many of you. And, and crucially, I think, follow any guidance about your current studies that your, your schools and colleges are going to make to you 
over the course of the next few months. I think it's really important that you keep up to date with your work. Okay, so that's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you briefly later on in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you also for the Unity Aces plug. Very, very kind of you. Um, but I, I think one of the, the key things I took from that, and, and so brilliant, brilliant advice throughout, but the, one of the key things I took from that, and I'd really recommend you to, is the tip about you know, keeping a, a presentation record or a spreadsheet of university virtual open days, because so many are going on now. It's so easy to get confused between the two. Um, I think it's a great way to, to you know, stay, tri stay on track. So thank you, David, really appreciate it. And, and as David said, if you've got any questions for him, all the rest of our panel and um, the Q&A is, is open, so do send them on. If I can now introduce my uh, our second speaker, and, and Phil, uh, do feel free to get the presentation ready, just what I'm doing. So Phil Mansell is joining us from Plymouth Marjon University, and Phil is going to do a session on student life. He's the student recruitment officer um, over there, and without further ado, Phil, uh, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Thank you again for having us and, and thank you for, for coming and listening to what we've got to say. I think what David was saying there about uh, online events is, you know, really important to, to go and make sure you, you get the best taste that you can for all the different universities that you might be interested in. Um, and so, so I'm going to talk a bit about student life and some of the things that you actually might see in those presentations, those online events. Um, so a bit about me first. Um, so I work at Plymouth Marjon University. I'm the communications officer. So I work in the student uh, recruitment student liaison team um, and if we were um, in normal circumstances you might see me out and about at UCAS events and, and things like that. Um, so I spent four years at university, I did a, an undergraduate degree and then a, a postgraduate degree. So I spent quite a while at university, loved it and hopefully um, have some sort of valid experiences to talk about. Um, whilst I was at university I got involved with quite a few aspects of student life, so societies, um, student newspaper, uh, getting involved with my course and, and a few other things as well. So to start with, I'm going to talk about your course, because I think actually your course is probably uh, one of the most crucial things um, about your university experience. So really, um, the course is what you're going to spend most of your time doing, um, you know, between contact time and independent study time. That is actually what you're going to spend the crux of your life at university doing, really. So it's important that you weigh up your options you look at all the different courses around the country that you're interested in obviously the university really matters as well uh, and so those sort of go hand in hand making sure you pick the right university um, and their version of the course that you're interested in so contact time and, and independent study time is really important um, how often are you going to be on campus studying how much of that time is going to be um, in seminars in lectures in workshops um, how do you like to learn? Um, what, what exactly is it that you want to get out of your university experience in terms of a, a learning, a face-to-face -face or, or, or virtual learning? Um, so, you know, those are questions to ask. Um, are you going to be required to do quite a lot of independent study? Um, is that something that you feel geared up for? Or is that something that you might need to, to sort of call on some, some support at the university for? And I'm going to talk about student support later. Um, are you looking at practical courses? Uh, are you looking to become a teacher or a nurse or a uh, sports therapist for instance um, if so um, you might want to look at that university's equipment and facilities um, how easy is it to access that stuff you know I did a, an MA in journalism how easy was it for me to get that equipment um, and, and, and use it as freely as I wanted to um, so those are things to consider how many people are going to be on your course and, and how many people you can be battling with to potentially get access to some of those facilities so, so those are interesting questions to ask. And again, as David said, those, those questions can be asked um, at the individual university events, um, whether it's a core session or whether it's sort of more general sessions, you know, there's always time to ask those questions. How does assessment on the course work? You know, are you somebody that really thrives on exams or do you prefer doing courseworks? Um, coursework could be presentations, um, uh, you know, um, group work. It could be practical tests, that sort of thing. So, you know, that is an important thing to consider when you're looking at your courses as well. There's a lot of talk all the time, particularly at the moment, about where courses get you. You know, will this course get you this job? Um, will, will it get you this much money by this age? And actually, there's a lot to be said about that. But of course, you want to be inspired. You want to get to where you want to go. You know, are you looking at a course that is immediately going to get you a job on a certain amount of money? Or... Are you looking at somewhere that's going to give you really good skills and really open your mind to the different areas that you can go into? So it's really worth considering that and, and also sort of speaking to people from the course and seeing what, what they view 
um, the course as in terms of where it's going to get you. So a really important thing, um, probably the thing that everybody talks about the most when they're talking about university is the social side of things. So there's a, a number of elements that, that play into the social side of things at university, but the student union is a massive part of it, central to most universities. Um, they handle things like clubs, societies, student media, whether that's a newspaper or um, radio. Um, in terms of the social side of things, they ha also have massive um, involvement in terms of representation and, uh, and dealing with student feedback, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later as well. But the student union, um, you know, is there a club and society that you're interested in? If not, student unions generally are pretty keen to set that up. Um, some universities um, don't require that many people to be interested in a new society for that to be formed. Um, there are people uh, in the student union that will be responsible for helping set up new societies. So if you look at a university and you think, this is perfect for me, but I'm not sure that there's this society that I'd love to get involved in. I, I really wanted to get involved with this. Maybe it relates to your course, maybe it relates to politics, maybe it relates to something else. Um, but you know, they're, they're probably gonna be more than happy to help you set that up and get that off the ground. So where do you want to live? It's, it's a big question. Um, are you looking at moving away from home? Are you keen on staying close to home? Um, do you want to just travel to the complete other end of the country? Do you want to see a new area? Um, it's, it's a really important question. Um, and and what, what is in the surrounding area around that location? And that really links to nightlife um, and the other things that you might be interested in, your interests. Um, does that city or town or wherever it is that you might be looking at studying, does it have what you want in terms of a cultural and, and sort of extracurricular activities outside of your studies uh, and potentially work? You know, do you want a really, really amazing nightlife with loads of different places to go to? Do you want nice cinemas and, and music venues? Um, or do you want somewhere that's maybe close to the sea or, you know, it's got really amazing surroundings? It, it's really important that you consider that. And, and quite often those things are, are talked about in, in university open days or virtual open days and things like that. But it, sometimes it might be, you know, you digging into the, the, the city or the place that the university is based and seeing what is there for you there. Again, the surrounding area, um, and this links quite personally to, to, you know, if you're moving away from home, how easy is it for you, family, friends, um, to go to and from where you live um, to your university? Um, it could be, um, it could be that, you, that you do want to go home quite regularly, um, and so, you know, maybe you want to look at somewhere a little bit closer to home, or somewhere that at least has easy access to and from home. Um, or, but maybe you're actually quite keen to get away, you want a bit of independence, that sort of thing. Uh, it's definitely worth considering. Accommodation. Accommodation is massive. Um, my, my main advice on accommodation would be in normal times, get in and have a look at it. Um, same goes to the university campus. You know, get yourself a guided tour, um, get yourself into accommodation, see what it looks like. Is it affordable? Is it, is it, can you picture yourself living there? Um, how many people are you going to be living with? All these things are probably firsts for a lot of you in terms of thinking about actually moving out and maybe living with people that you, you don't know to start with and, and that can seem a little bit daunting but um, you know that there's a lot put into place by universities so that you can find people with similar interests that potentially they'll match people up on similar courses that you'll be living in the same flat or block of flats so that you can really get to know people but in the meantime whilst you're not allowed on campus and we can't welcome you um, which is really sad but do your virtual events as Dave was saying get, get on you can do virtual campus tours um, there might be videos of accommodation, there might be somebody that can actually show you around accommodation, all those sorts of things. And, and that's sort of the best bet at the moment is to, to get in and have a look. Um, but there's a lot to sort of consider with accommodation price, feel. Um, is that accommodation on campus or is it going to be accommodation that you need to travel from there to your lectures? Um, that was the case um, in my uh, undergrad, particularly my first year at university with different campuses. So I, I, um, I lived on one campus and, and travelled every day to another. Is that something that you want to do or do you want to live? on campus and be in the heart of it all and have a, a two minute walk to your lectures, which is always quite a nice thing. Working whilst at university is quite a, a, an interesting one because not everybody will need to do it, but it's something that maybe some people don't consider until they, until they realise that they're at university and perhaps they, they need a job. Um, obviously the student finance, maintenance loans, bursaries in some cases, um, and they do fantastic jobs of keeping you going. Um, and, and giving you that sort of bit of spending money um, and money that you need to settle in and, and enjoy your life at university. Um, but sometimes you might want to top this up. Um, you might find that your course is not so time intensive in terms of time spent in lectures or seminars. And actually, it gives you quite a lot of flexibility to work around that. Obviously, we always recommend that your studies come first 
and 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 that's what we'd always want you to put first but at the same time we appreciate that you know you might need to go and get some part-time work whether it's at the weekend or whether it's sort of around your studies i think the the main question here is about finding the balance so i've called it the work studies partying balance but you know it might not be between those three three things it might just be between worker studies it might just be between studies and partying you know you've got to work out what works for you um how many hours can you put aside to do some part-time work um you know will you be able to commit to all of the clubs and societies that you're interested in and quite often if it's involved with the university there will be flexibility there and and you know you'll be able to to work with maybe your clubs or societies or or your lecturers there might be flexible timetables you can work out particularly if we're looking at things online um obviously if you guys are looking at a little bit further ahead in terms of applications you know we, we don't know how things are going to be but there's there's quite a lot of questions there about um the balancing everything that you will have going on at university we don't want you to overburden yourself and and um and commit too much but but work is an option um and so sort of linked to that in terms of um flexible working opportunities there's quite often on campus working opportunities so if you're keen to live on campus study on campus work on campus and, and really sort of get into that university bubble then then there's loads of job opportunities on campus you could be working in the su bar the su shop um, you could potentially be doing some work for various teams across the university. There's loads of opportunities and I'm sure um, that varies by institution as well. Some universities will have loads of opportunities that probably other universities won't have. Um, one opportunity that, that most universities do have in, in some shape or form is the student ambassador scheme. So that will be where student ambassadors will become the representatives of the university, whether it's working things like virtual events, online events, um, on campus events when we're allowed to do those again um, and, and also representing um, the university in the local area perhaps doing outreach work for local schools or in the local community um, working at events like graduation or potentially things like UCAS exhibitions or, or external events and and that's generally pretty well paid as well and, it, and it's a really fascinating way to get out and speak to people and get to know your university better and, and work with people from around the university and quite often those those hours can be built around your studies as well. You're not under no commitment to um, to work a certain number of hours a month or anything like that. You can sort of be quite flexible in that approach. At least that's the case at a margin. I wouldn't want to speak for every other institution, but you know that that is sort of generally what I find. Opportunities linked to your course um, is is quite relevant as well. Um, potentially things that you would want to look into maybe deeper into your first year as you move into your second year and third year. Um, speak to your lecturers. Um, they will know of opportunities that. That you can um, that you can take part in that that you know maybe not available for everybody but they're available for people that are studying on a certain course. Um, lecturers know a lot of people. They usually get ways to the local community for, for their area, and so they'll 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 know a lot of uh, of opportunities if they're available. Um, and another another example would be you know is there a gym on campus? If you're if you're a sports therapist student. Um, why not go and work at the gym as a, as a gym therapist or a gym instructor? Um, that sort of thing. There's, there's always something to look out for on campus and potentially that could be linked to your course as well. And finally, um, for, for, for working at university, there's, there's careers or employability or futures teams on campus who, who help you long term in terms of getting you the careers jobs after you've finished or, or when you're coming to a, an end of your time at university, but they can help you throughout your time. Um, quite often there'll be a, a central mailing list where um, the careers teams or employability teams will, will email out to everybody on that mailing list with with um, job adverts that they've become aware of or or trusted suppliers of jobs so people that they know um, students have worked with in the past and it's been safe and it's been a really good experience um, so sort of get onto those mailing lists speak to those careers people um, from as soon as you can really in first year because they'll get to know you and they'll get to to know exactly what opportunities you're looking out for and, and that can sort of fit in quite nicely with um, with the other things that I've talked about in terms of on-campus opportunities and, and the balance that you need to strike. So final slide from me, um, support at university. There's a, a wide range of student support, um, disability inclusion service, equality, um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia tests that you can get from the student support team that will really help you with your learning if, if it's sort of found that you do suffer from, from one of those um, conditions. So that's really one, one thing to look out for is the, the variety of student support that you can get. And, and to be honest, you might not even realise that it's student support. There might just be something that signposts you to something to ask a question. And that is effectively using student support and, and really accessing that. So your course team, um, if you're struggling with anything that's related to your course, whether you're struggling to balance things um, or it's issues that you maybe just don't understand something that's been discussed or um, there's a certain skill that you're not being able to master, 
then there's people from your course that will be more than happy to help, whether that's your lecturers, um, whether you have a personal development tutor, again, that might have a different name depending on the university you're at. Um, but th these are things to look into, you know, will I have that personalized support that I might need when I'm at university? And that's the sort of thing that you might ask uh, at an open day or virtual open day. A student admin as well, play a really vital role in terms of timetabling and, and knowing what the issues are, if there's an, a, a technical issue, perhaps the way that you're uploading your coursework or anything like that. And then those people are there to, to talk, take your feedback and actually implement that feedback, you know, make sure that, that your voice is heard. Study skills of library staff. So again, this might be, this might be a, a different team name, uh, depending on where you're looking at, but there's pretty much always um, a team of people in the library that are helping with your skills, whether that be research skills, resource finding skills, um, just developing the way that you study and, and the ways that you access research. Um, quite often that does run out of the library. Um, and yeah, those study skills are really valuable. Again, careers and futures guidance. Um, get in on the ground floor, get in, speak to those people in year one, you know, make yourself known. And, and if there's any issues that you're having that, you know, potentially there's, there's financial issues, there's also, uh, it's part, probably part of the student support team, there's going to be financial guidance that you can get, there's going to be people on campus that can help you, um, there's potentially hardship funds, that sort of thing. Um, but if you want to speak to somebody about your career path moving forward or, or potentially um, your, your job opportunities right then and there, then those are the people to speak to and, and they can be really valuable. And finally, the student union, they're really more than just the, the people that run the bar or the people that run the clubs and societies. They are there as representation for you and the student voice. Um, so there will probably be people designated within the student union to deal with certain, um, certain issues. So there'd be somebody that might be a mental health advocate. There might be somebody who is a, an equality and diversity advocate. Um, and so that there are people that work within the student union that are probably still students, but, but have expertise in those areas and can really help you. Um, if you've got any questions that you, that you want to ask or, or issues that you're finding across the university that you really want to improve. Um, I'm, I'm sort of sorry to end on the support university note because obviously university is going to be an incredible experience for you. Um, but it is important to know that there is help if you ever need help. Um, and it's important that you, you know that before as well, because, um, you know, university is an incredible experience um, for everybody. Um, but sometimes, you know, you might find difficulties and, and that happens to everybody in any walk of life. So it's really valuable that you, you, you know where the support is at university, what level of support you can get, um, particularly if you've got any um, specific needs. So if, if there's any disability needs that you, you need to tell the uh, student support teams about, you know, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to speak to you in, in the application process. Um, potentially even before you get to that stage so that they can tell you exactly what support they'll be able to offer you when you get to university. Um, but yeah, I, I think sort of following on from what David said in terms of accessing those events, asking these questions, um, you know, really um, checking out as much as you can um, and, and really finding out exactly, is this in institution, is this university right for me? Um, or do I need to look at other, other places? Um, does it sort of tick the boxes? In terms of the concerns that I have and 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 the, the feelings that I, I want to get from a university, because you know quite a lot of it can can be based on gut and how you really feel about a place when you walk through the doors, whether they be virtual or physical, uh, and sort of really get to see a place. So um, yeah, just make sure you check it all out. But but that that's it for me for the time being. I'll, I'll look forward to sort of talking to you a little bit more about Marjon uh, very briefly later on today. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, really, really appreciate that. Great, great session. And, and to be honest, the support at the university is one of the big questions that, that students have. So and whilst there's a subject, it's probably not the you know, really upbeat one you'd like to finish on. Um, a lot of students will be wondering about what support they get. So really, really appreciate that. Right. Our final speaker, please, is Matt Wall. Um, Matt, feel free to get your presentation ready just while I'm introducing you. Matt is a student recruitment officer at Keele University. And Matt's going to talk about the transition to university. So over to you, Matt. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much, John. Um, thanks everyone for taking the time to uh, listen to us today. It's a really, really good opportunity for us to uh, reach out to you guys. As you know, we, we normally come out to your schools and colleges and deliver these, you know, sort of sessions and have really good interactions with you at UCAS fairs and all that sort of thing. And unfortunately, due to the 
due to the circumstances that hasn't been able to happen uh, this year but hopefully we will be getting all sorted and getting back on track before long. Just to give you a bit of a brief introduction um, from me, my name is Matt, I work at Keele University, I am one of the student recruitment marketing officers. Um, I've been there for about three years now and again you know, my job generally, you'll, you'll see me out on the road at, at different UCAS fairs and that sort of thing. And I'm always there to, uh, to answer any questions you've got. Today, we're going to look at the transition to university. So a couple of things to consider just before we start um, and, and some things to definitely think about are what transitions have you already made? You know, start thinking about, you know, have you already made the jump from GCSEs to A-levels and how you actually went about that? And you know, how did you overcome any hurdles that you found that, you know, got in your way? Any differences and changes that you may face as well? We're going to look a little bit into how you need to prepare for university and your next steps as well. So just a few things to think about as we go through. Um, so straight into the transition that you've already made, we'll do a quick comparison of the GCSEs into A-levels and BTECs uh, at college or sixth form. So when you were studying at GCSE level, you would have had a full timetable of lessons, uh, throughout five days of the week, uh, studying 10 or more subjects. You could have potentially studied, I would imagine, in your sessions, taken almost six, maybe seven of those subjects in a day. Um, there would also been a lot of after-school sessions available, which would have helped you um, academically just as a bit of a booster as well. And generally in exams, you find that the, the exam questions would have been a little more straightforward too. The transmission that you've made there into A-levels and BTECs is, is quite a lot different. Um, a lot of limited time uh, with lecturers in comparison to when you'd have been at school, not, not as much time with lecturers as you would have probably spent with teachers. Um, longer sessions, and I, I know when I, went, when I was at school studying GCSEs, the, the lessons were about an hour long, the, you know, they might may have changed now, but when you were studying A-levels and BTECs now, you're probably in an hour, two hour sessions. So some longer sessions, a little bit more independent study as well, which, is great moving towards university because that amount of independent study will actually increase as you, you move to uni from, from your A-levels or your BTECs. And you study less subjects. So generally you will study, you know, the four A-levels or if you're studying a BTEC, you would study one main subject with lots of different modules within it. So let's now talk about where you're at in comparison to university and things to sort of think about. So when you're at A-level, when you're studying your A-levels or your BTEC, um, there is, a lot of reliance on key core texts and there's little requirement for, for wider reading. A lot of the um, research is focused on Google or Wikipedia searches and references isn't necessarily required. Obviously that is subject dependent. I'm sure that some of you are doing lots of referencing at the moment. Uh, but when you get to uni, a lot less reliance on the core text um, and you'll be expected to find your own useful range of, of sources which you will need to um, accurately reference any that you do use, and there is a greater focus on primary research literature as well. So moving on a little bit to how it might change in terms of your day-to-day -day life from being at college or sixth form and going to university is that you will, on your timetable at uni, you'll have your lectures, seminars, and tutorials. Now you're currently probably working in what we would class as tutorials in smaller groups, doing some group work as well but also on your timetable at university you'll be in larger lectures and seminars some lectures can you know can hold up to 400 people at the time all reading off the same page um, there is lots of opportunity for practical teaching as well and practical learning when you're at university especially if you're studying lab-based subjects you can see in the uh, the image on the slide there there's a uh, bit of a crime scene investigation practical um, assessment going on there so some really good activities to get involved with on all the different courses and as we have mentioned before there is a lot of independent study which is why the uh, universities which some of you may or may not have seen on, on different visits if you've had the chance to have got huge libraries and lots of lots of study spaces because there is a lot of independent study time that you'll get when you've got downtime on your timetable. Getting a feel for it, I know we've uh, David and Phil have mentioned this and gone through it, which is great. And like we said, unfortunately, we, we can't get to open days or offer holder days. You may have also heard them um, be called applicant days. We can't get to those physically at the moment. But as, uh, as David's pointed out, all of the universities have got some fantastic virtual events on at the moment. And they are, with, you know, university staff working around the clock to, to get those online and live for you so that you can get the best experience in, in 
to get the ability to compare different universities. But if you do get the opportunity, whether that's later this year or next year, depending on where you are in your journey at the moment, 100% go to an open day or an offer holder day if you do receive an offer from a university. It's a great chance to go and see exactly what you're, what you're taking on at different places and see how you've got to change and, and see what life will be like there. So 100% you know, advised from me to go, you know, go to uh, either the virtual events that they've got running at the moment or when we get back up and running, get over to the open days or offer holder days that are available. So thinking about some life skills and thinking about you know things that you might need to change um obviously this will be um some people will be a lot different than others but thinking about can you or can't you if this is especially aimed at people who are thinking about moving away to university um whether you're going to go into accommodation can you actually cook for yourself uh, do you know how to budget your money can you use a washing machine do you know how to iron um you know, can you do a weekly shop? Can you plan your time effectively? You know, time time management's really important when you're at university and you know how to change your bedding. Um, so that's just a few life skills to think about in terms of your transition into university from where you are now. Um, thinking about budgeting, again, especially aimed at people if you are going to live in accommodation, look out for student discounts. Providing you've got your student card, there's lots of opportunity for student discounts. Um, in, in lots of different shops and they've always got big advertisements in the window can definitely save you some money it might be worth as well if you, especially if you've got uh, close friends on your course or housemates dependent on where you're living to share the load in, in terms of transport so if you all need to go and do a shop on the same day try and sort of join together and, and share the load in terms of that also consider cheaper modes of transport some of you may have gone through a bit of a transition now you may have uh, when you were studying at, at your secondary school, you may have been a 10 minute walk from school and now you've gone to sixth form or, or college. You've had to think about, you know, walking to the bus stop, getting on a bus and going over to, to your college. So considering cheaper modes of transport will definitely help your budgeting and buying rail or bus or travel cards will help too. Um, there is a... Um, there's a definite advantage to buying things sort of if you've got a, a five day pass or a week pass or six month pass or even a year pass, it definitely works out cheaper. And also think about sharing the load too. So if you do live in a flat with a few people and you do share a kitchen in your accommodation, think about could you all do a shop together? You know, bulk buying is always a little bit cheaper. So another way of thinking about how you can actually save some money and budget yourself at university. A few things to remind to remember whilst you are thinking about your budgets as well. There are some other things that people don't always remember when budgeting. Um, there are sometimes some course costs. The uh, course costs um, you might need a lab coat, you might need some art, art materials, there might be some trips that you might need to pay for, um, some printing and stationery. Um, and don't forget your bills. You've got all your accommodation, your TV license, and insurance to make sure that you think about. Ensure that you've got enough money for food so that you can feed yourself. Textbooks and travel, obviously making sure that you've got the right funds to get where you need to be and don't forget to save some money back so, to, so that you can go out and socialize as well because that is really important at university uh, a question that uh, phil did actually pick some some pointers up on um can you work and study at university absolutely providing that you've got good time management and um you, you're really on top of your work there's definitely the opportunity to go off and um get a part-time job there's a lot of opportunities on different campuses in different universities. A lot of places have got city centres, town centres, local areas to go out and get some part-time jobs as well. And the student union is always a great place to go and look because they've often got shops and cafes and stuff inside and bars. So they also, there's part-time jobs available there. There is also the student ambassador schemes that most universities run. Now student ambassadors help out at open days and other events as such. Um, and they get paid to do so and the work's really flexible and can fit around your study as well so some really good opportunities to get employment as well when making your decision obviously you, you you're going to be doing a lot of thinking about your course and you're going to be doing a lot of thinking about exactly where you want to be but also just make sure that there's something else to offer for you there you know the, there's lots of clubs and societies that that are available at different universities um, lots of places to eat and drink, at students' unions, sports facilities, uh, shops, you know, big open study zones. Are you, are you somebody that's going to make use of them? Make sure that they are available if so. Um, and, a, a, and a really good library as well. So just make sure that there is things on campus that'll, that, will, um, that will be a good use for you and, and sort of think about that when you're making your decision. 
Um, as we have mentioned, I think both speakers before me have mentioned there is so much support. So if you do struggle getting into terms with any of these transitions or changes as you go from studying at college to studying at university, there's so much support on hand. And it's really important, like Phil mentioned at the end of his talk, to know that, that the support is on hand with financial advice and student support teams, as well welfare and guidance services, counselling and mental health support. And there's always security on on all campuses and the, uh, there's always advice units and sort of ask areas in the students union so there's always somebody on hand to help so absolutely don't worry about anything if you think it's a little bit daunting as Phil mentioned that you know the support is there for everybody um, and that brings me to an end so thank you very much